So last time, David told us about sets, functions, and then presented a definition of category. Um, and so what is a category? To remind you, a category is about dots and arrows. Um, David calls them morphism. The arrows morphisms. We'll also use the word map and, I don't know, switch interchangeably between them. But today I'm going to say arrow. Um, and so what a category looks like is, is dots and arrows. There are a bunch of dots and a bunch of arrows. But a category also has some additional stuff. We didn't end the de definition here. Um, and in particular, the additional stuff is about composition, because categories are about composition. And what all this stuff says, what this number three first says, is that if I take an arrow and it goes from A to B, and I take another arrow that starts at B and goes to some other thing C, then that's the same as just I can evaluate that or I can um, think about that in the same way as some arrow that's equal to some arrow that just goes directly from A to C by passing B. So, for example, if I have a program that accepts some strings with some things, sort of sentences and sort of passes them up into a sort of list of, of its words, right? So this is a, a program that accepts a string, returns a list of strings. And then I might have a, another function that takes a list of a list and just tells me the number of elements in that string, in that, in that list. Um, then composing those programs is the same as writing a single program that just takes a string and tells me how many words are in it directly without ever producing a list. So we've got that, but in fact there's this more structured category. And what this, this structure says is still, it's, it's still about composition. Uh, but you don't only have paths of length two in a category. You have paths of any length. Uh, be it sort of an empty path, which sort of starts at a node and doesn't do anything, or it might start at this point A, go to B, then go to some other thing C, D, and end up at something E. And these laws say that it is uniquely uh, the same. I can find a, an arrow that goes directly from A to E, bypassing all of this other stuff. Right? So that's, that's what a category is, dots and arrows and a composition and composition. Um, so why are we talking about this? Well, the guiding metaphor of this class is that pr programming languages can be thought of as forming a category. And in particular, we'll talk about uh, the programming language Haskell, which is well suited to this sort of thing. And in this vein, the metaphor says that the objects are the types in Haskell, and the arrows are the functions. And the, the, the point of this is that because Haskell has been designed with categories in mind, and it's because its user base sort of often thinks categorically, you can work with Haskell much like you work with a category. And so learning to think about categories, learning to sort of use, use the language of dots and arrows and composition allows you to express yourself in Haskell. But for now, I want you to forget sort of this analogy completely. Yesterday we saw as sort of the main example of a category, the category of sets and functions, but I also want you to forget about that category. The reason is that that category is, is an incredibly important category and it gives a lot of great intuitions, but it also sort of bleeds a lot of intuition that are really specific to those sorts of examples. So you might find yourself asking, like, this is an arrow, and you might say, what function is that? What What's, what's its, what are the elements of its, its source? These are, these are not questions that make sense in terms of the language purely of categories. And so if you find yourself asking that, I want you to stop asking yourself that for now. Um, because, and, and the, the point, the, the structure of this first part of the lecture is just to throw a lot of examples of, of categories to you that don't have that flavor at all um, to help you sort of thinking about really what the essence of this structure is. Again, sort of thinking set theoretically is, is a really useful tool in, in thinking in general, in math and in programming, and you should recover that mode of thought. But having this extra mode of thought available to you, even if it is sort of confusing and requires some persistence at first, and it does, what that sort of confusion and persistence is doing for you, I, I think, is um, opening up sort of this new mode of thought. Uh, which allows you sort of more effectively express yourself in sort of the purely categorical terms. 
OK. So there will be sort of three classes of examples that I want to talk about uh, right now. The first is the notion of sort of categories as shapes. Uh, second as ordered things, so more technically pre-orders. Um, and third as, as monoids. So let's go through this. So one, shapes. OK. So here's a picture of a category. It has one object. Uh, I wonder if I can draw a table somewhere. Objects, arrows. So it's one object, one arrow. Um, again, this is the visible part of a category, but a category also has this sort of invisible, at least hard to draw, composition rule. So I need to sort of specify to complete this sort of data structure what is at least the composition rule and so on. Uh, but I've claimed that this sort of is at least sort of uniquely a category. So what happens, let's call this thing uh, A for now. And what we know about A is that uh, you can, what we know about categories is that we can trace over paths and it should return a single arrow, right? So I might trace over the path, I'll do A, and then I'll do A again. So what should that be in this category? Right. It has to be A because, I mean, the A, A composed A has to be an arrow that goes from this point to itself, and there's only one arrow. It's, it's A itself. So it's, it's incredibly trivial. Um, so people often call this category just one, or they call it the, the walking object. Um, and in some sense, it captures the essence of just being an object, um, and is incredibly important for that purpose. OK. So we can do other tricks to create small categories like this, like uh, OK, so I should also mention that this being a unique arrow, every home set, so every, every sort of every point must have an arrow for, to itself that's called the identity arrow. And in this picture and in future pictures, I'm going to suppress that arrow. Here, that arrow, I mean, there's only one choice for it. It's the arrow A, so A is the identity. Um, and so in this picture, I'm drawing an object with uh, sorry, I'm drawing a category with two objects, and there are implicitly two arrows uh, in, uh, I'm not going to call that two, uh, in this category. Um, but this, again, is, is a well-formed category. The composition rules are basically the same as the composition. I mean, what are the paths that we can do? We can sort of loop around in this point, or we can loop around in that point, and that's the same as just doing it once. Right? Um, here's another category. This category is often called two. Um, this, is, this category here is the essence of a pair, in some sense. Um, and it's, it's sort of in the same sense, uh, but as, as David was talking about elements of, of sets as being functions out of one. So in some sense, this set here, just the, the bag with one element, is, contains the essence of being an element in, in terms of sets. Because if I have another set, uh, let's say A, X, smiley face over here, um, then the elements of this set, A, X, smiley face, are the same thing as sort of probing this set with this one element set. Right? And in the same sense, uh, if I think about the, a two element set, then pairs in this set are the same as functions from here to here. They're the same as I'm going to choose one element X, and I'm going to choose element smiley face. So I choose the pair x smiley face. But the essence of the notion of pair is here. OK. So we have these two categories. This category here, in the same sense, is the essence of being an arrow. Um, again, so this category has how many objects? Two objects. And how many arrows? Three, because I implicitly sort of suppress the identity arrows. So there's one arrow here, one arrow here, and one arrow here. OK. Um, now, I still have to define composition identities, uh, but using the same sort of argument, oh, I'll do it one more time. So for example, say I want to compose this identity arrow with this, this arrow here. Uh, well, what should its composite be? Well, there's only, it needs to be an arrow from here to here, but there's only one, so we have to choose that arrow. And so we sort of get that structure basically for free. Um, so we can also, I mean, another, David introduced the notion of isomorphism yesterday, and so, I can define a, 
a small category of the shape isomorphism. Um, in this category, so it has, again, two objects. Uh, how many arrows does it have now? Four. Four. Uh, and so, and, but now we actually, ha well, we don't really, we still don't have to specify a composition rule, but it should be, uh, one thing you should realize is that if you do this arrow and you compose it with that arrow, that's the same as just the identity arrow there as it has to be like in the previous arguments. Uh, yes? So I have a question about the morphism. For example, for the second one, uh, mm -hmm. the morphism between the two dots or the dots? Sorry? The, the, the sec this one? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so there are no morphisms between the, the two dots. So for example, uh, if I was going to do this a bit more explicitly, which I will do now, uh, I'm going to call this object 0, and I'm going to call this object 1. Right, so that's my set of, and I'm going to call this p for pair. So my set of p has two elements, 0 and 1. And then now I need to specify, I'm sorry I didn't sort of make this clear. Uh, for people that aren't used to this notation, this upside down a is, no, is sort of said for all. So this says for all a, b in, in the set of objects. So for all objects a and b, we get a set and we call this the HOM set from A to B, so the set of arrows from A to B. So there are four HOM sets I have to worry about here, right? I have to worry about, um, sorry for erasing, but I have to worry about P00, I have to worry about P01, and then the other P10 P, uh, and P11, right? And so it's enough to talk about these two. So P00 has a single arrow in it, it's the identity arrow. So I'm just going to call that the identity arrow. Now, P01 has no arrows in it. So this is the empty set, and we write that like that. OK, a uh, question here. Is there a name for set of all morphisms? Um, there are names, none in common use. And I, I don't think we'll, we'll need a notation for that. And I don't know, David or, or Bartosz, do you want to <coughs> use a word for the set of all morphisms, or the collection of all morphisms? No. OK, no, we won't introduce one. Um, it's a thing you can consider, but interestingly, it sort of seems more useful to break them up into all these that, that explicitly declare the, the source and target. Um, there is a nice category you can draw, which is sort of the essence of being a category. And then you have an object that represents the, the thing of all morphisms. But let's, let's not get into that. Um, OK, second class of examples, pre-orders. Um, so these are, these are classic categories where we make the arrow set deliberately very thin. We sort of restrict ourselves to having an, a single arrow between, or the between a pair of objects or not at all. So in fact, all of these uh, are examples of, of pre-orders. Um, but to sort of give more of the order flavor, uh, one example is sort of the, the category where the objects are the natural numbers. And the arrows are sort of, you have an arrow from A to B, they're sort of factor of. They're this statement, this, this predicate, you might say. Um, so you have an arrow from A to B if the natural number A is a factor of the natural number B. So for example, 1 is a factor of 2. It cleanly divides 2. So I'm going to draw an arrow from 1 to 2. Um, similarly, it divides, well, basically everything. Um, 2 and 3 both divide 6. So I have arrows to 6. Uh, what else? 1, 2, 3, 4. 4 lives over here, maybe. Um, I guess 12 lives up here. Are there two arrows from 2 to 4, or just 1? Ah, good question. There's just 1. Okay. Um, it's just expressing the fact that 2 is a factor of 4. We don't care sort of which factor it is, in some sense. Um, is there an arrow from 3 to 12? There is an arrow from 3 to 12. But uh, again, Part of drawing these categories uh, makes it is there's some sort of like notation management. Boards are actually quite finite. Uh, so what I'm doing is I'm suppressing uh, the if there's an arrow from three to twelve, I'm sort of suppressing it because it goes through six. Uh, and so really, you cons should consider the morphisms in this picture to be the paths uh, and not the the arrows themselves. You can only ever have one arrow from A to B. That's, that's sort of the, this idea of order. And that's, that's, I mean, 
yeah, that sort of uniqueness is exactly some sort of ordering. Uh, so you can think of that arrow as saying less than in this order. Anyway, so this category continues upwards. Uh, it's, it's very big. Mm -hmm. is uh, that you've told us that this is an isomorphism. Right. Is there a notation for showing that this pair of this pair of morphisms is an isomorphism? Um, um, sometimes you write like tilde, like a squiggly line, or like even. Uh, so isomorphism is a lot like equality, uh, but it's slightly more relaxed. So you might write something like that. You might only have one. You might have one squiggly line and one straight line. Uh, it depends on the convention you set up, but that's a good question. Um, yeah, all of the, so all of these pictures should not be really taken as like some formal notation that you can use, recycle any, any community that you, speaks category theory and they'll instantly know what you mean. Um, but they're more meant to give you a flavor of sort of how to, to picture and think about categories. Um, so another, another sort of way of thinking about a pre-order, another example of a pre-order, uh, comes from this sort of structure in Haskell uh, known as type classes. So, I haven't told you what a type is, you'll know by the end of the lecture, but um, types are, types sort of are collected into, well, type classes, and certain classes are subclasses of another. So there's a category where, a pre-order in fact, where the objects are Haskell type classes, and the arrows are sort of subclass um, inclusion, I guess. So for example, uh, working down, there's a class um, of, of number types. Um, so if you, you have a type and it's the type of, say, the natural numbers, uh, the thi one thing that you can do with numbers is, is compare them. So there's a sort of small, well, a larger class of things called ordered types, which are just types where if you have two terms of the type, you can compare them. Is A less than B? Is B less than A? Uh, is neither true. Um, and so number types are sort of a, a subclass of ordered types. Um, if you can compare things, you can definitely say whether they're equal or not. And so there's a type, there's a class of types where you can talk about equality of terms. And that's uh, eek there. Another word you might be hearing a lot is functor. Um, so there's a type class called functor. And every, uh, there are other things called applicatives. And every, and an applicative is a kind of functor. Um, similarly, I'll go to your question. Second, a monad is a, is a type of applicative, and also, I don't know, these things can branch, right? So a comonad is also a type of functor, or a sub, subclass of functor. Uh, question? You said if you can compare things, you can determine they're equal, but that doesn't depend on what you define equal. Like if it's Latin as equality, ah. Yeah, that, that was a little glib, and I, um, but in, the, in, in particular in Haskell, uh, you might have a type in this, in this class, right? And so then you can decide whether sort of statements like this are true or false. And so because of that, you can sort of define an equality thing that says uh, A is equal to B if in up here, A is less than B and B is less than A, less than or equals. For that specific definition of equality? Yes, yes. Yeah, so, so this sort of, this thing inherits uh, a definition of equality from the order structure. Uh, oh, interesting. Do Bartosz, do you have a comment? Um, okay, well, thanks. <laughs> the, the comment was does, does, uh, that, that perhaps num doesn't inherit EQ anymore. Oh. oh, cool. OK, great comment. Um, on to another class of categories. Uh, and this is monoids. So here, uh, pre-order is sort of a, a, a class of categories where the arrow structure is very simple. Um, monoids are a class of category where the objects are very simple. In fact, they're the categories with only one object. They're sort of a cleaner, uh, sort of more foundational definition you can give, but I'm going to say that glibly for now. So for example, uh, I might decide I have one category where the, there is one object. Uh, and then because there's one object, uh, these set, 
this, this for all is quantified over just one thing, right? So there's only one set of morphisms. Uh, and so I just need to choose one set. And I'm going to say choose the natural numbers. So here, objects equals nothing. And then arrows equal the natural numbers. So I have an arrow from this to itself called 0, um, 2, and so on. Right? Um, so here's the beginnings of a definition of a category. And you'll note that sort of because of the structure in a monoid, uh, every pair of arrows is composable, um, unlike in, in, a, in sort of an arbitrary category where we have to make sure that the objects or the, you think of them as types maybe, the types match up. Right? The source of one thing must sort of be equal to the, 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 tar well, sorry, the target of one thing must be equal to the source of the thing you do next. Uh, but anyway, I'm defining a category. So I've defined objects and arrows, but again, a category is, is about composition. So I need to say, uh, if I run around on this thing, I do 2, and then I do 0, and then I do 1, and then I do 4, uh, what single arrow that amounts to. Um, and it turns out there are many ways you can do this. right? Uh, so does anyone want to say some that would make this a category? Adding. Sorry, adding? Yep. So adding is an available composition rule to you. Someone said multiplying. These are different categories. These are different categories. Uh, so, but yeah. Maxing. Maxing, yeah. That's good. Uh, so there are three different categories here, each with the same objects and morphisms, or arrows. Right. Um, so another, I mean, so, so this, this idea of a, of a monoid is sort of very, very fundamental. Um, and part of this point is to show how flexible the notion of a category is. Uh, so looking around the house for an easy example of a category, I stole my housemate's Ru Rubik's Cube. Hi, Sean. Um, and so here, this is a category. It has one object. Uh, and the arrows are just operations on a Rubik's Cube, right? So if I have some operation, I have like this one, I have that one. And I can compose them because that is also an operation on a Rubik's Cube, and so on. So that's a. Uh, the group, I mean, this is a two by two by two. Uh, but it's, the, it's still quite a large category. Um, anyway, so another example of a monoid is a, is a Rubik's Cube. OK. Um, so that was a bunch of material. And I expect people might have questions. So let's take a break uh, for a second. Uh, here's a task for you all. Um, first, so find uh, someone nearby. Um, say hi, and then pick one of these categories, sort of explain why you like the category. Uh, uh, yeah, you have to like it. And then also explain why is it a category. So what are its objects, morphisms, blah, blah, blah. And in particular, I haven't really spoken much about the laws. So, so tell them why it explains the associativity and, and unit laws. OK. Um, so first, is there anything that anyone's not sure why it is a category or, or that they want to talk about? Yep. You could. Um, well, let me think. I mean, you could, you could put in that arrow, but then you need to figure out like, what your composition rule is. So uh, for example, if I have two arrows from two to four, then I don't know if I compose the first arrow. Yeah, I mean you could, but I, I don't have a creative. I, on the spot here, I can't think of a way of defining a composition rule. I don't know whether anyone can. You have to be like identical because you have an identity from A to A, and then you have two, two from two to four. So if you compose from, uh, you pass a left identity like two to two and two to four. So that should be equal to two to four. So, so two to four must be. Um, you could add another arrow there and just have everything composed to the unique arrow that already exists. Yeah. Yes, yeah, but presumably if you're throwing two arrows from two to four, you want it, the multiplicity to be increased across the board. And then you have a lot to consider. Uh, I don't, I'm, I'm not quite sure about your argument that it, it'd have to reduce to being the same thing. I think you can do a more general thing. Paolo? I think you should allow for stuff like permutations, like more loops. 
Mm. You can get a so right. I have a book, it's take final sets. Uh huh. And surjective map whose cardinality of fiber is constant. And then take the opposite category of that and throw away the empty sets. So you should get a category like that. Okay, so it can be done. I'm not going to explain what that means. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, any any other comments? Of the, the, the unit for max? The unit for max. Ah, good question. So, there's, so we're defining a category. Our objects are, uh, well, there's a unique object. Our arrows are the natural numbers. Our composition is, if we take given two natural numbers, so 5 and 7, we return 7. And the question is, what is a good number to choose such that if we sort of max this number with any other number x, it always returns x. Um, and so remember that the natural numbers. So does anyone? No, it doesn't. Uh, so these are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and arbitrarily high, but not infinity. I think I heard a 0. So yeah, so 0 is the, is the identity in this example. Uh, great question. So the min doesn't actually make a category. Right, unless you include it. So there, if you include infinity, then you get a category. But that's, that's a great, great comment to make. Uh, whoever was shouting out, whoever restrained from shouting out minimum there was doing a great job. Um, so I think that's <laughs> all of you. OK. Uh, that's great. I want to now make some remarks about just sort of thinking categorically and draw out sort of some some principles which will sort of stay with us throughout this course. Uh, they'll be added, thinking categorically. They'll be added to, but just sort of three comments. Uh, and the first, uh, I've said a category is dots and arrows and then this sort of less visible composition rule. But another way of thinking about categories is that they're about relationships. Um, so the first principle is that relationships matter. Um, so. Category is about dots and arrows. Here's an arrow. Uh, and in some ways, uh, one, one good way to think about this, di this diagram, as particularly if we fix one of these, fix the target object, is that this thing is, can be thought of as a probe. Um, so remember, yesterday we talked about the category where the objects are sets and the morphisms are functions. We call this category just set. It might be a slightly confusing pun, but I'm going to stick with it. Uh, there's, so there's this category set, uh, and we saw that so that if we really want to understand another set, uh, here's a set of fruits, sort of apple, orange, pear. Um, we can understand this by picking a probe this, of this shape and just testing it out, just figuring out what all the functions to it are. Um, that's something that's very special about the category of sets. Um, but so what's special, um, to sort of get you used to the notation a bit more, is that if we have a set x, then x is the same in, some, uh, in the sense of being isomorphic, which we saw yesterday, as, and so this, this set here is being used in the sense of the, the C. It's the, this is the name of the category. So this is the home set, the set of arrows from 1 to, to x. And so a set is the same as its, its set of arrows. So if we just probe it with the shape, we understand what it is. Um, so in some sense, we, ca we can call element, uh, functions out of one in set just sort of elements. Uh, in general, uh, this is not true for all categories. So there's not some special object which you can understand some object of by just by probing. But there is a, a sort of a notion which we're just going to call a generalized element. Um, so if we call this uh, object A and this object X, right? Uh, I want to say that. It's useful to have this word, uh, a generalized element of some object x in a category of shape a is just an arrow um, a to x. So. It turns out, um, in a sense, we'll, we'll make it we'll make more precise as the course goes on, uh, but that, that sort of goes by the name of the Uneda principle, that uh, an object of a category is, is no more nor, nor less, really, than sort of all of its generalized elements, all the different probes you can pick uh, that, that it, uh, and looking at the sort of ways that this, 
this sort of shape can probe that object. Um, so uh, a phrase, I don't know, that's, that's in my mind uh, that comes from the Johns Hopkins radiology department for some reason, is that one view is no view. So in an arbitrary sense, so what this is saying is so this medical setting is that if you're sort of imaging a person uh, or you're trying to diagnose something, you really want to take sort of many, many angles, many pictures. Um, and so each, each one of these is sort of the picture that helps you describe and get to know what this thing is. But, but more than that, um, if you can extend the, that sort of saying, it's not just that you want to take x-rays or something, that you pick one sort of probe. It's that you, you need sort of all these other machines available to you in the category. You need your sort of MRIs and your CAT scans and so on. Um, and, but the, the magical thing is that if you sort of range over the entire category, you get to know this object completely. It's, it's nothing more than all the ways you can image it. OK, so that's part one. And we'll get back to sort of that sort of UNADA thinking, especially in the, uh, as we talk about universal structures. Mm -hmm. So is A like any category? Or is oh, sorry. This is, yeah, so this is a generalized element. So fix some category C. Uh, and so A is some object of, so X is an object in C that we want to understand. And we pick some other object A, think of it as a probe, and use that to sort of analyze X. Uh, that in, in set, just sets. Um, in cat, for example, I mean, one reason I'm sort of uh, stealing Bartosz's thunder, uh, I think was the phrase used yesterday. But uh, one, one thing, so in the, in the category, yeah, there's a category of categories. Um, and in, in this category, the objects are categories, and the morphisms, uh, the arrows, are these things called functors. Uh, and so the, one of the reasons why you think of this as the, the walking arrow or the essence of arrow is that you might pick sort of this as your probe as an example of A and the functors from this to some other category just sort of pick out all the arrows. Um, so that's an example of a shape that's very useful in that setting. That's a bit more general than this setting where really like sets so special that everything's transparent to this one all seeing object. Um, yep. Mm -hmm. That's a good question, and we'll sort of get back to it as, as the course goes on. Um, maybe we'll even see some more tomorrow. Uh, sorry for sort of that glib answer, but uh, yeah, I, I th we'll, we'll cover that. Uh, so I want to talk next about duality, uh, and this is the, the thing I want to mention is that any sort of thing you do where you sort of live with one arrow pointing, uh, arrows going out or something, also works with arrows going in. Um, and so you can do a similar thing, a sort of a dual sort of UNADA type principle, where this thing is the observer, where you think of fix this, and instead of sort of probing it, you sort of look at shadows coming out. Um, so you view this object as the observer. Um, I'm, you might sort of define an equivalent thing called generalized attribute or something. Uh, but I'll, I'll move on. Um, and a third principle is there's just sort of, uh, David mentioned that sort of isomorphism, sort of isomorphic objects are the same. Um, so isomorphism is the right notion of sort of sameness. It's, it's a bit weaker than equality, but it's what happens in categories. And you sort of see this, one way of thinking about it is this through this principle. Uh, so I mean, I might have two isomorphic sets, like 0, 1, 2, the set 3, and um, I don't know, what was I using before? Goat, cat, turtle. Uh, it's some sort of wish list or something. Uh, and so there's, they're isomorphic because there's a pair of functions that sort of goes back and forth between them, sort of a one-to-one -one correspondence between them. And they're, they're enough to be a this is enough to sort of be the same from this perspective because if I just take any other sort of, say, observer and I look at it, well, all this, all this these is sort of triples pulled out by these, these sets, right? So this, these two sets look the same uh, from, from this point of view. Um, so that, that's sort of a, a heuristic principle that we can get into in more, that you'll sort of see as the course goes on. Um, I want to switch gears for the last sort of 15 minutes or so, uh, and now actually get to some Haskell. 
because um, I promised this was also, well, we promised this was also a course about programming. Uh, and the syntax of Haskell is sort of based on this thing called the lambda calculus. So I thought it would be fun to sort of calculus to start with this almost historical lesson. So the lambda calculus is about functions. Um, and so we're going to fix some sort of variable set. So I have these symbols available to me. And there are sort of two, th two things you can do, really. You can create functions. Um, and the way you do this, which is where it gets its name from, is that you can write lambda x and then some, some expression uh, in the lambda calculus. So I'm just going to write a. Uh, and this says that in a, you should consider um, any instance of x. You should consider a a function of x. Right? Um, so this is sort of known as lambda abstraction. And then the other thing you can do with functions, in fact, the only thing you can do with functions in this language is apply them. Uh, so given two, and, and in fact, everything is a function. So given t two terms, you can apply one to another. And this sort of operation is so, so primitive that we're not even going to use a, a symbol for it. It's just sort of juxtaposition. So this is application. Um, uh, that it, this is composition in, in a sense. So an example of a lambda term is just sort of, say, this very simple identity lambda term, lambda x, x. And so what this says is that if you have, you have an expression here, which is just says x, and you should consider that a variable, since we said consider x a variable. And so if I take some other if I juxtapose that with some b, I guess maybe is a better letter to use, then there's this, the, 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 thing, the thing that makes this a model of computation is that there's this notion of reduction. Um, or, and so you can, uh, this says, this thing now is x, and we should substitute that in here. So we just get b. And so that's what makes it sort of an identity type expression. Um, I guess it's not. It's often used to see things that aren't trivial. So uh, for example, I might write a compli more complicated lambda expression like sort of x, y, x or something. So I form that thing, then that thing, then I said consider x a variable. And so if I apply this to some expression, let's call it sort of zz or something, uh, then what this is saying is that this thing is to be considered x. So it reduces to, so we substitute that in here, and this expression reduces to zz, yzz, right? Um, so everything is a function. And it's also the case that you can sort of stack these functions. So, uh, so you might want a function of y that returns a function of x. So here is an example of that. Um, and so I guess I, so here is, this says y is a variable. And we're going to substitute it in there, and it's going to return a function of x. So this can be sort of thought of as a function of two variables. So if I plug in a and b into it, well, the first thing I can do is reduce this internal expression that says this, this a should be considered the y. So this becomes lambda x, x, a, x. And we're still applying it to b. And so then this becomes. Um, so the, this is now x, right? So this becomes b, a, b. OK. So um, the, Hask the syntax of Haskell is based on, on this. Sorry, I got to a question in a moment. Uh, is that in that uh, you can, so oopsies. So here's the identity sort of expression in lambda calculus. Uh, in Haskell, we might define the identity using, using this notation, where you s use this backslash instead of lambda, because they kind of look similar. And instead of the dot, you use this sort of arrow, uh, which is just dash then greater than. Um, so this is how the identity in Haskell is defined. Um, you can also, so uh, if you are trying to define other functions, say you fire up. Uh, if you have Haskell running on computer, you can fire up sort of the interactive compiler um, and type in expressions like square. And because that fires up, it includes a whole lot of functions available to you already. I can say that like lambda x goes to x squared. 
or for two variables, I can do like implies is lambda y, lambda x goes to y, not y or x. So this is, this is the syntax for all, and this is the syntax for not. Um, so that's one way to define functions in Haskell, and that's sort of the, the base level. Um, Often this is a bit harder to read than you might want in, in a program, if you're, especially if you're not used to it. And so you can also, there's this thing that Haskell does well, which is called pattern matching. And so you can define these functions by pattern matching. So if I want to define the identity, I can write identity x equals x. Or I can write square um, x equals x squared. Or I can write implies. Uh, I think I should say yx, sorry, is equal to not y or x. OK, so there are some, some definitions you can make in Haskell. Um, you might be wondering, sort of, this is a very sort of universal, the claim is that this is a very expressive, it's a universal notion of computation, uh, and you might be able to define um, and so you, but it looks very sort of, it's, a, it's very unstructured, right? So how, how, you, how would you work with like doing, say, even Boolean logic with that? Well, you need to find lambda terms that you would call true and false, uh, and then sort of juxtapose them in this way. Uh, and and it, it sort of can be done. It's universal. So there, there's a sense that I'm not going to make precise that any program you write on a computer can sort of be compiled down to this language and sort of run there using this notion of reduction. Um, let me take some questions, because I know they've been lying around for a while. So you asked two questions. So uh, the first is the application thing. Mm -hmm. uh, is it so how is it associated? No, is it uh, Yeah. It, so no. So, um, but if you if you write this term in like Haskell, then it will automatically do that. Okay. Because I was confused by the ah. Like right. And yeah. Oh, this one. Yeah. Okay. So this would be parenthesized like that. Sorry. The third. Oh. Uh, to the right. Ah, here. So in this Haskell syntax. So this arrow is is just the same thing as this dot here. Um, I probably shouldn't have used this arrow here. These this arrow and this arrow are completely different. Um, so so this is some expression, and I'm saying that sort of this is the name of a function. It's sort of some some variable you can write down. I'm just saying that whenever you see this, you should think of it as that. Um, well, that's what the, the compiler is doing. And the equality here? Um, no, down. down. Right. So, so this, is, this, is, this expression here is syntactic sugar in Haskell for this expression. Oh, sorry. It means that uh, when the compiler sees this, it turns it into this. Um, but. Uh, you might think of this as just like this notation, identity of x equals x. So this is like, it's, it's easier, it's maybe easier to read if you're used to this mathematical style of, of writing down functions. Uh -huh. um, when, so like in the bottom corner of the board, when you like define the function, um, when you define the function, how does that going to be syntactic? Because like, when you say like, assign it, variables, and do the same rules apply, or if you like, update something? I think there's a good answer to that that I'm not able to give in the next two minutes. Oh, sorry. Um, can I even do that? Uh, the question is, how is this different to binding variables? And if you update something, does it go back and, and change that? Yeah. yeah. Um, maybe I'll leave that to, to Bartosz in the next lecture or after the class. Um, unless you have a, a short phrase now. I think it you'll get binding. into late. It, it is? OK. A name to a, to, to an expression. Okay, it is binding a name to an expression. <laughs> 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 um, 
Okay, thanks. So what does it mean when you have like two letters just next to each other? Like, like writing square? No, like oh. uh, lambda z dot z z. Ah, um, lambda z dot z z. So what does it mean? It means, it means z acting on z. Yeah, it's so it's, it's application. So everything, every expression here is a function. Uh, well, can be considered as a function. So this function acts on another function uh, on itself. Uh, it's, so, so one thing, so OK, I guess I'll end with this point. Um, this, this is a very expressive thing, but it's also kind of confusing. So if I'm writing some, some expression in Haskell, or in, in the Lambda calculus, then I can write, there's no control over what I can ap apply to what. Everything's a function that can be applied to every other function. So I can write expressions like, I can apply implies to elephant or something like that, like string elephant. Or even worse, I can apply the string elephant to the function implies. Uh, and so wh why this isn't a great sort of language in itself for, for um, I don't know, working with people for writing production level code is that this sort of lack of structure uh, means that it's sort of, what's the right way? It's, it's hard to express yourself. Like it's, it's very expressive, but it's, it's unstructured. And a lot of this course is just about how to structure things. So let me, let me give an analogy that I was going to give um, shortly. So this is a backpack. My wife got it for my, for my birthday last month. I'm kind of pleased with it. So there's a big unstructured sex section. Um, and this is really great because as long as I, I'm carrying this much stuff and I can find a creative way to fit it into there, then I can perform that task, right? Um, but it's bad because I can do bad things like pack my glasses at the bottom of the case, a <laughs> bag, and then have to take everything out to access them or to modify them or to like, so I say, well, get my glasses from David, get my glasses from these ba this bag, and David has to like empty my entire life out uh, onto the floor. But it's good because it has structure. So my glasses are in here, so I can say, David, my glasses are in the front pocket, get me my glasses and replace them with my sunglasses, and David can do that, right? <laughs> uh, so a lot of this, this course is about, or a lot of this sort of language design question is about how to find the right balance of sort of this really expressive sort of free stuff, uh, f powerful stuff, and also enough structure that you can sort of adequately uh, communicate and uh, sensibly modify what you're doing. Uh, so the solution to that in this setting is to introduce types. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about that in the next lecture. But getting back to this, uh, the types will be the objects of a category, and that's what this course is about. Thanks. <laughs>